Do I need to clap too? No. <laughs> I always really want to know what that clap's all about. I just like clapping. So you can time the. Who doesn't like clapping? You just sync it. Sync the audio. Sync the audio. Okay. <laughs> no weird noises. Neither the weird noise. Do the predator noise. Oh, he does that so good. How do you do that? How do you do that? A lot of time by myself. <laughs> How are you doing that? I don't know. It's like it sounds like a just, diaphragm. It sounds just like the predator. No wonder I can't I can't use an out call either. <laughs> <laughs> don't point your finger at me. <laughs> it's funny when you try. All right, should we jump into it? <laughs> Let's do it. All right, we are live, back for another Big Hunt Guys podcast. Got myself, Brady Miller. We got Chris Neville and Trail Kreitzer. And we're going to talk about Nothing But Daylight, a little film we just came out with. You guys went up to Alaska, did some bow hunting for caribou. Mm-hmm. Had your brother, Josh, there. Had Luke mm-hmm. Dusenberry filming. Yeah. Sounds like it was uh, quite an adventure. Can't beat Alaska. It's the best. It is good. The ultimate. Every time I go up there, I think, why do I not live up here? So what was the, uh, how do you guys get started on the idea of going to Alaska first? Just like try something new? You wanted to go on an adventure or just cross something off the bucket list? I feel like that was you that started that. Yeah, I, I've been a few times. I mean, I've been up and hunted moose and I've hunted blacktail on Kodiak a couple times. And I think I probably... I can't remember if it was you or me, but one of us put a bug in the other's ear and said, hey, we should go up on a caribou hunt. And, I mean, I've always wanted to hunt caribou. It's been on my bucket list forever, so, like, since I was a kid, you know, mm-hmm. just such a cool animal and, uh, you know, I- icon, really. They, it really is. Big, big, giant hook antlers. And, I mean, I love antlers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think they have the, uh, I think I said that in the film, but, like, you know, largest uh, – antlers per body ratio right mm-hmm. of any yeah any, any ungulate so anytime you can have you know big giant set of antlers I, i'm intrigued i just wanted to go to alaska just um, wanted, yeah that was your first time in alaska ever yeah. right not my first I, I did like an alaskan cruise with my family but oh. nothing no no <laughs> hunting. <was> that? <laughs> similar i don't recommend there's a lot of old people on those cruises <laughs> did you it was cool though you go and look at all the glaciers yeah okay <laughs> okay but yeah, never, never been up there hunting. Man, I'm holding back. So f- I like, I just want to jump in and just really explore what this cruise in Alaska was like. It's just like any other cruise, you have different stops. You spend a couple of days in different towns in Alaska, then you go around different glaciers. Yeah, that's funny. A lot of old people. Well, yeah, I'm not a big imagine. cruise person. Boats, yeah. boats are kind of boring. Yeah, I hear you. This is better, a better adventure. Oh yeah. Way better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, Alaska is like, you know, the last frontier, right? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of cliche, but I, it really is. I mean, just the opportunities up there are so vast and the, the landscape is so incredible. And I mean, it's, once you go up there, I mean, it's, I don't know, your first time up, what was it, what was it like? Do you just, are you just itching to go back? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wish I was going back this year to do something in Alaska. Yeah. I remember that feeling too. After the first time I went up, just the the wildness of that landscape and just the remote so remote and being out there on your own it's there's something to it it's real magic it's a, it's magical it it's really like, is it's like it reminds me of what it'd be like going back in time mm-hmm. you know see going into these places where like animals everywhere fish everywhere like how the landscape was meant to be mm-hmm. before humans were here just plentiful animals everywhere yeah we did see a lot of caribou a ton. And it's cool because over the counter. Mm-hmm. So it's a really cool thing to start planning on one of those if you don't draw any tags or you just don't have the points that year. Like, do something different. Plan Alaskan adventure. Yeah, those we um, we we flew into Anchorage and landed, and you know we had Justin Schaefer, buddy of uh, Josh, that works yeah. over at Kuyu. Josh's buddy. Um, they kind of worked together. He was nice enough to pick us up and put us up for a night in his garage and it set out cots. So we spent a night there. We had a, a early morning flight the next day. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, we just went down to sportsman's warehouse and bought our permits just over the counter. Yeah. And I will say the Alaska hunt you do plan obviously further in advance. And to me, like the hardest part was logistics. 
Yeah, I want to dive into logistics because I remember we were at the old office when we shared a little office together and you were constantly on the phone with, I don't know what it was, the flight people, transporters, just logistics of how to get the gear up there. Like walk me through right. all that stuff you have to do ahead of time. Because you're not like you just like throw your shit in a truck and you just mm-hmm. go somewhere like we do here. Like it's a lot of planning. Right. So I think first you got to figure out obviously what type of hunt you want to do, what time of year. And I'm just looking through my emails. The first time I made contact with like a transporter trying to figure out what our plans were for the fall, that was in January 11th. Wow. And this hunt was in August. So there's yeah, almost that much year. yeah, in advance of planning. And then a lot of it's just figuring out the transporter. I mean, you can get to Alaska on normal airlines. It's from there, finding a transporter to take you to a location to where you want to hunt or areas that you can hunt. So did you guys then figure out where you kind of wanted to be dropped off or did you just have to navigate with the transporter first and they have the guidelines of where the caribou kind of are going to be or how does that part work? A lot of that's going to be dictated by where they can land. So um, I had some spots picked out. Uh, I talked to some some friends that had been up there before, and they'd had some ideas where where they had hunted and, and they'd been successful. And I had those points on a map, but uh, when you get up there, I mean, a lot of it's just going to be dictated by where hunters, other hunters, have been dropped and like what's accessible. Because I know, like when we were there, a lot of the the runways that he could land were actually underwater because right. they, they'd had a lot of rain, and uh, it. Yeah, I mean, I, I had spots picked out, but we ended up, he, he ultimately dropped us where, right. yeah, where he, he thought yeah, was Yeah, because, I mean, it depends on how many hunters were in there before you. Because mm-hmm. he was messaging me a lot when we were out there, like, are you guys still seeing a lot of caribou? Because oh, well. then he was probably planning on bringing more people out there after. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they're putting you in spots that there's going to be animals. I mean, yeah, you they, have a ton of area. Yeah, they, they can't guide you. So a transporter can't guide you. They can't give you, you know, intel. They can't say, hey, I'd head that way. You know, it, it really is just... We're going to meet you at the airport. You're going to load all your gear in a plane and we're going to take off and we're going to drop you off. And then you're there on your own for however many days you're, you're booked, you know? Um, so it's, it, you're not guided at all. It really is. I mean, in, in that instance, it's a drop camp. They're yep. just going to drop right. you. And I think we, so here our logistics plane wise getting up there was flew out of Vegas, flew to Seattle, Seattle to Anchorage. And then usually your layover in Anchorage is like a day or can be. Yeah. 13 hours, 14 hours, so you have a really long layover in Anchorage, so you don't fly out to the next day usually. Mm-hmm. And then from Anchorage, we went to Kotzebue, mm-hmm. and then our transporter, that's where their air hangar was, was in Kotzebue, and then we got on the transporter, which was a tiny Cessna plane, and, and then we, flew, what? Yeah, probably it's like 80, an hour, 90, yeah, hour, hour 90 flight. Yeah, miles, something like that. Hmm. Kind, of, kind of north. But I would say... Yeah, one thing, I mean, we, we were lucky in that we landed in Cots and we got on the plane the same day. Um, I, I I think it's it's not entirely uncommon where people land in Kotzebue and then they end up staying a night or two nights or three nights wow. before yeah. they can actually get I would, a flight I would out. Def, I, I was always telling people, and I, I heard this before going on this hunt, you got to bank for a couple of days on the front end of the back hunt, back end and the front end of the hunt with weather delays and stuff like yeah. that. Like you could spend two days in Kotzebue waiting to get flown out to where you're going to go hunting. And it could be the same on the way back, which in our case, yeah, it was. Yeah, I've never gone to Alaska and had things go, you know, according to, to plan as far as like, I'm going to show up on this day and I'm going to return on this day. It just doesn't happen. The, the weather days are just so sporadic. So that jumps me into a question, even though probably jumping ahead, but like, do you plan for a return flight right away or do you pick up a return flight after your hunt? Yeah. So that's one thing I, in previous trips up there, I had bought a round trip. So I'd paid, you know, bought, you know, flight up and a flight back. And I think that was a mistake. I, I think the, the better route is to book your flight up and not book a flight in return. Because unless you've, you know, unless you've got some sort of deal with your airlines where you get free cancellations and, you know, you changes know. in your flights or whatever. But for me, I think it's smart to, to just kind of hold out and wait and then book a flight when you have a chance to actually get back into, you know, civilization. You can book a flight back. Yeah. I mean, it, it'll save you some headache. I've, I've, I've done it both ways. And like I said, the times that I've booked, you know, return flights, it's stressful because you're sitting, for example, I was sitting on a boat in Larson Bay going, 
well, my flight was supposed to have, you know, le- left in an hour or whatever. I'm oh, gonna, wow. I'm, You're I'm still gonna, in the bush. Yeah, I'm going to miss that. So then I'm trying to, uh, you know, schedule a flight or potentially schedule a flight back and trying to work through, you know, satellite messenger, whatever it is. But it's it's a hassle. It's just stressful. In my, in my mind, it's really unneeded. Like, just, just wait, hunt, have a good time, figure it out on the way back. Did you guys try to do any deals with your flights, like get the old Alaska Airlines credit card and do those like companion type flights? And my brother, flights? he did that for this trip. He got an Alaska Airlines card, which yeah. I think I would recommend to people if you're going to do an Alaska hunt, because you're essentially getting enough rewards once you sign up that you can have a free flight back up to Alaska exactly. if you want to go back up there again. Which and you could even probably use that credit card as your like hunting app credit card right. and just pay it off that way, the annual fee yeah. and all that stuff, make it worthwhile. For sure, and I know a lot of people that do that. I'm not smart enough to do that. I know that it's out there. I just haven't done it. But okay. you're you're right. That is the best way to do it for sure. You get free miles. And your and your luggage flies free, right? Right. Like you, you have a certain amount of luggage that you fly free if you have a an Alaska card and you book your flights through Alaska. So let's talk about luggage and gear then. Mm-hmm. Since you just talked about that, like, how did you guys figure out how many bags you're going to take, the weight of every single bag, you know what what the strategy is there? Because I know we were talking off the podcast a little bit about some bag stuff. Like, what are your what do you guys kind of do in that route? Yeah. So I don't know if every transporter is like this. Like. Our transporter, I mean, we've know people that have went through these, so we knew that, like they're a legit transporter, like they have yep. their stuff figured out. I don't know if they're all the same or not, but they sent us documents that told us exactly how much weight we can have per person, all the gear that we, they even supported, like gear list, oh, just that's like good. random stuff that you should consider to bring. But yeah, ours was it's the plane that we're on was seven hundred pounds that it could handle. So that's 700 pounds. There's two people that go on the flight and then all your gear. And that's your weight included too. No, your body weight? Yeah. So it's your body weight. So two people's body weight and then all their gear has to be under 700 pounds. Yeah. And I don't know if this answers your question, but in terms of gear, there's really like two ways of looking at it. You can either, you know, pack your gear and pay the shipping, you know, the the fee, the baggage fees when you go to the airport Mm -hmm. and just travel with your luggage up there. Hope it makes it. Or two, you can look at options of actually shipping your luggage prior. So like midsummer, you know, May, June, July, yep. get, get your luggage together, you know, put it in some crates and, and shipping it up to the transporter's address. And then when you show up, you know, your, your gear's there. And for the most part, they're cool. They obviously know you're going to go through their service. They're cool with like storing your gear for a little bit. Yeah, we, we didn't do that. We just traveled with ours and paid the baggage oh, fees. What was the... So to ship crate, you have to be a licensed mailer. Oh, that's what they, I remember you on the phone with doing that. Yeah. So a lot of this stuff, obviously, you have to do this well in advance. You have to become a licensed mailer, which takes a couple weeks. And then to mail yourself up there, it takes a couple weeks. So you have to have all your gear dialed in like a month or so, if not more, in advance if you want to ship it up to Alaska. We were procrastinating. It was mm-hmm. like two weeks before the hunt. I'm like, hey, I'm trying to ship crate up to you guys. And they're like, well, you're not a licensed mailer. You can't ship crate. Hmm. And I was like, well, how long does it take to become like a licensed mailer? It's like, well, it's easy. You fill out this application, but the application might take a week just to get qualified mm-hmm. to be a licensed mailer and then to ship your crate way up there. So we just took all of our luggage, just put it on the plane, which... Which worked out. Yeah. I mean, you run a risk of potentially, you know, losing something, which yeah. would suck. Um, but I mean, it, it worked for us and you do pay baggage fees. I mean, we, I don't know what we paid, probably 300 bucks or something, I would say. I was trying to think of how many bags we had each. And baggage fees. I mean, I had my bow case, which had, you know, my sidearm and my bow and, you know, arrows and those kinds of things. And then I think I had one other piece of luggage, which had uh, just like extra clothing and that kind of thing. And then in my backpack is like my carry on, which I always carry, you know, the things that matter most to me, which are my optics. Yep. And then I usually carry one full gear setup. So, you know, base layers out to, you know, insulation pieces, boots, just in case there was something to happen and I lost my luggage that I would have like a full set of gear. So you were doing that as your carry on? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Stuff, did, so yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. I did that as my carry on. And then, um, you would have had your, your bow case. Yeah. I had a bow case, a rifle case. I had a 150 liter outdoor vision bag that I threw all my gear in that besides like my optics and stuff. I think I did the same thing as Charlie. I kept all like my important stuff carry on with me. Mm-hmm. And I think in the one bag that I had the extra gear, I think we also had the tent. Do we have a food bag? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we may have had one more each because we we had the tent, like a full tent. We're all sitting here in the sky dome. 
Skydome six person stone glacier tent, which is what we used up there. But we had that in one, you know, dry bag. And then we, we had one bag that was just full of food. And I think that's the bag that I had my additional equipment and then my, my rations of food and my food. I, pa- I packed that out just like I did for any, you know, backpack. Yeah, every, I, every day. Yeah. I had food. that a day of food, you know, per one gallon mm-hmm. Ziploc. And I had those all just done. Yeah. I, I think Trill and I really did our normal backcountry setup. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't too much different. And I think that's when we figured out after being in Alaska and being soaking wet every single day, we're like, probably could have brought some more gear. <laughs> So yeah, the like, fun- like gear in terms of terms of food, or gear in terms of like more rain gear, more for sure food. We can get into that if you yeah, want later, I'll- but for for sure food, and then uh, yeah, I mean insulation pieces. I would have because you're gonna get wet. Yeah, you, you get wet, you know, and you, you you almost need like a full change of uh, clothes because you're you're gonna like for us, we didn't really have enough sunlight or warm weather to to really dry pieces out. So we were just basically using body heat in the tent or, you know, like a stove when we were cooking dinner at night to try to dry some stuff out. We had it hanging on a line in the tent. But yeah, you almost need like a full set of gear beyond like the one day just to to have dry clothes. And then in in terms of like when you're bringing your gear up there, do you guys obviously use like dry bags, duffel sacks that are kind of waterproof for throwing in the plane or? Yeah, we just had... We have a we had outdoor vision, mm-hmm. 150 liter bags for tents, food, and just like our each of us had like a big duffel bag for our random gear, and like our clothes that we'd wear throughout the trip. Yes, we and used a, a backpack, like I said, for my yeah. carry on, which is my my Stone Glacier pack, which I think I took a Sky 5900, I think, and then um, for dry bags, we we took these outdoor vision duffels, and they're just a, a waterproof, right. um, you know, plastic style duffel that you yep. see guys take to Alaska because they're you know they're watertight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they work great. Yeah, it all all was pretty good. And then what's the other question I have? Obviously, I've never done this, so I'm asking some random questions that probably seem easy for you guys now. But once you got to the spot where you guys are going to fly out into the tundra. Mm-hmm. What is that process like? Are you guys actually standing on a scale with your baggage to figure out exactly what you weighed and then throw it on the plane? Or do you kind of already have the idea from a previous thing because you're waiting and you have to go through that? We're repacking anything? stuff. Yeah, so I, I kind of had a heads up that the turnaround on those can be really quick. So you might show up, um, you know, from your flight from Anchorage to wherever you're headed and they may say, hey, you need to be fully loaded in the plane in the next 20 minutes. Oh, so wow. that's like... Everything ready to go because the turnaround times for those guys is everything. I mean, those bush yeah, they pilots, have a short window. yeah, they short windows, weather windows, um, you know, and they're they're trying to get people out and back in. So like they're really juggling a lot, you know. So turnaround time for them is really tight. So um, for me, that's why I did all my food that way. I mean, it was all prepacked, ready to go. Um, my bow in my bow case. I mean, essentially all I had to do was you know grab the stabilizers, grab my dozen arrows, and you know and go. Uh, the, our main bag, like the tent, it was all packed, ready to go. Pretty much everything that I had was like ready to go so that when I landed in cots, I could throw everything on a scale. The only thing I really did was change my clothes, you know, cause yeah. I was wearing some travel clothes. Um, but yeah, that's essentially how it is, is you throw everything on the scale. So both of you throw all your gear on the scale that you're going to go. They weigh you, you stand on it and they say, yep, you're good to go. And then you basically just throw that in the back of the plane and Right. load up yeah, I, think that's, I think that's really good advice too because like part of me was like oh maybe you guys had like a normal piece of luggage and then while you were there you're quickly repacking again but you said the turnaround yeah. so tight that that'd probably be a bad idea yeah. to not have things dialed ahead of time so you can just go and there was a lot of people that had their crates like they're going through their crates so essentially they had all their stuff there then they're repacking it hmm. which took time and yeah like i would recommend this is my personal preference if i was going up there again i would i would get a big enough duffel where i could fit everything in there, my backpack, my gear, my food, everything in one giant duffel. So when I got there, take it, put it on the scale, step on, get on the plane. And you might not really then care about overweight baggage on your earlier flights. You're like, it's just is what it is. Like you have to just You're going to be overweight. Yeah. (laughs) Most likely. (laughs) Yeah. No doubt. You're not going to meet that 50 pound. No, you're going to be overweight. No doubt. Yeah, I mean, you could show up and you could have a weather delay and spend two days in town and have all the time in the world to reorganize and organize your gear. And you could show up and they might say you need to be on the plane in 20 minutes. Yep. I, I yeah. would say be prepared to turn and burn, mm-hmm. you know, because ultimately that's what you want anyway, right? Like once you land in Cots or wherever you land and, you, you know, you're there to go caribou hunting. Yeah, or you want to get out there. Yeah, you want to get out there. So if the pilot says, hey, yeah. I've got a weather window. 
let's go. You know, yeah. you, you want to have everything ready to turn and burn. So I would say plan that way. Yeah, because if you if you don't make that weather window, it could be another two days. Mm. Three you days want, where you you're make your weather window somewhere. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you don't want to be on you that why you didn't get out there because you didn't have your gear mm-hmm. shit packed. And the, and the, so on our trip, there's four of us, and there's two people that can fly. So we had to do two different flights. He dropped them off, came back, and dropped us off. So we put as much gear on the first flight. It was trail and our cameraman and a pilot. And then we put as much gear as we could. I think it was like 600-some pounds. And then my brother and I got all of our gear on there, and we weighed it, and we were like 300 pounds. They're like, yeah, you, you have 400 more pounds if you guys oh, wow. want to bring anything else i'm like where's the nearest liquor store <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that, that's why if you see, people have watched the film i have there's like a, a rack of coors light it's because i went to the Cotsview liquor store which was unlike any liquor store i've ever been to in my whole entire life wouldn't you say you can only buy like one case at a time yeah, or like a 24-hour yeah, period or yeah something? i had to get like a, a drinking permit to buy booze <laughs> And it's like this, literally some guy's shed that he has like just liquor filled up in there. But they had it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we were underweight, my brother and I, since we put as much stuff on in the first flight, like we were 400 pounds under. So we yeah, that was, that was smart. You load up that first flight with everything that you need. I, th- I think essentially the only, one of the biggest difference, we took the tent, all the, all the tent and all the food, right? So that when we would get out there, I could set the tent up before you guys landed. But yeah, you want to make sure you probably do that. That's my next thing. Yeah. is like, so the, like you guys could essentially land and let's say you didn't have your tent and then the weather window got bad. Sure. And what are you guys going to do? Obviously that should be a definite thing. You yeah. want to bring your tent, want to bring stuff so you guys could set it up. Yeah. Make sure I, you're all I, dialed. Thought, I thought that through. I thought, you know, if we go out, I'm going to take the tent and the shelter and, and food just in case, just like you're saying, I've been there enough to know that like you can get stuck out there. So we had, I would say that for sure. If you're going in on two flights, make sure that the first guys out have shelter. <laughs> yeah. How was it flying with a, uh, a sidearm with your bow? Is that pretty easy? It's actually pretty simple. I, I would say every time I've ever done it, it's actually easier going from the lower 48 to Alaska than it is from Alaska coming back. Um, I almost missed, I went on a moose hunt up there a couple of years ago and I almost missed my connecting flight from Anchorage back to, to Vegas because of a sidearm and, and them having to check in everything. But it's actually a pretty simple process. You just check in, you let them know that you've got a firearm. You obviously have to have it locked up. You have to have four, you know, TSA approved the locks. Um, I just locked mine in with my bow case. In your bow case, mm-hmm. okay. Yep, put it in there. Um, your ammunition, I think, has to be in a case. Yeah. Um, you know, clip out and everything. But Magaz- based- magazine, mm- magazine, yeah. Come on, try. Yeah, yeah. what did I say? Clip. clip. Yeah, my bad. Anyway, yeah, you just you just uh, roll up to TSA. They'll have somebody who'll come out. You hand them the keys. They take it back. They check. You know, your sidearm. Go through it, everything, and then come back. Give you a rec- you know, it's a sim- essentially a receipt, and yeah. and you take it and run with it. It's actually pretty simple. Yeah, and then we just brought one rifle for four of us we figured to save weight yeah and we I, don't, were, I don't know why we need yeah we had three bows so yeah, jo- tr- josh had a bow chris had a bow and i had a bow and then we brought one, one rifle, rifle. Mm-hmm. and then he had two sidearms right um i had a sidearm did you have a sidearm i had brady's oh we had three then josh had a sidearm <laughs> okay and then any any uh like pepper spray yeah i had bear spray I didn't but you had to buy that up there because you can't fly with that yeah. i think the transporter had yeah, some so our actually. transporter had all of our fuel canisters so because obviously you can't fly with fuel canisters okay so once we got up there they had fuel canisters that we could get what else did we get oh bear spray they had bear spray for us if we wanted some and that was free like they just oh hand to you to like take it and bring it back yeah Yeah. and then the fuel Mm -hmm. canister so like trail was saying you get to the hangar and it's kind of a scramble it's like hey you got 30 minutes we're we're flying out we're gonna make this window and i'm like all right i think i told josh is like get fuel canisters like get two big bigger propane tanks to like cook on we had a jet boiler like half gen stove yep. and then do one small one for each of us we get out there we had two big fuel canisters and two small ones and i'm like i don't know if that's gonna be enough <laughs> yeah. we were a little short on propane we were short based on the amount of days that i ended up out there kind of on my own i was i was pretty well out of fuel by the time i, yeah, I took we should, off we should dive into that one later i want to i want to hear that little story i'm going to stop us real quick so let's a clear cut right here this is something you're probably going to want to cover soon as possible oh wow breaking news on the podcast yes what is it yeah corner crossers cleared of all charges in wyoming uh-oh uh-oh is that going to set a precedent for everything else probably here can you, can you yeah send, let me send this to you real send quick Sorry, I thought... I no, breaking that's, news, I, we're all going to Wyoming to hunt. <laughs> <laughs> I 
No, that's um, a good thing to jump on the podcast while we're talking about this. Do you this. want me to text it to you? Yeah, you can text it to me. So while we're doing that, uh, what was your first impression, Neville, once you landed off the plane and you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're in caribou country? Like, what's the, what's the feeling in your thought process? Like, you're, just, you're out there. So excited. Just jacked. It's like your little kid on Christmas morning. It's Christmas just morning. Just like everyone's giddy, happy. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did, you guys, did you guys like see any caribou on the on the way in to get yourself jacked oh, up yeah. or any bears or moose or anything? Now, when you're flying, you see... When you're flying, I mean, the scenery is just absolutely stunning. It's incredible. You're flying over these giant braided streams and rivers and, you know, big conifer forests and open tundra. And this just big, you know, the day we flew in, it was big blue skies. Just absolutely stunning. Just stunning terrain. I mean, Alaska's gorgeous. So, I mean, before you even land, you're just like overtaken by expansiveness. Yeah, I don't, you've never, you never feel so small. I don't right. think like you, you feel your, you just feel your, your, your size, you know, cause the landscape is so incredible, but we did see caribou. I probably saw, I don't know. I saw one group of probably right. 200. I um, mean, for any hunt that I've been on, like the hype leading up to it, I mean, you prepare for it or think about it for five months and then you're flying in there. I mean, it's probably like the most excited I've been for a hunt and then as you're like flying across that landscape in that yeah. plane incredible you just sticking your phone out like the window get a yeah. bunch of stories yeah. like oh look at all this cool stuff send mom yeah yeah it is cool and it's it's also a little there's a little bit of anxiety because you don't know like what to expect i mean i remember probably for the first 40 minutes the flight you know i hadn't seen any animals and you're flying over just lots of tundra and you're like man i really thought i'd be seeing some caribou you know and then you start to pick out and you know oh there's mm-hmm. some caribou there's some caribou and then you're starting to really like gather that sight picture and then you're starting to see them all over the place and then yeah it does build but I, there's a little bit of anxiety yeah. too yeah i would say too because like you don't know exactly where you're going so like we're yeah. used to looking on our maps you, you, know, you have a you have a decent idea of what the terrain's gonna look like mm-hmm. we're just getting dropped off in the middle of nowhere I've never looked at this place on maps. Yeah, it's kind of like when you're and we're hiking. out there with our bows. We're like, God, I hope there's some terrain where we yeah, can get w- into range. I was gonna say that, like when we landed uh, on this bald knob, you know, it's kind of on a ridge. It's just a rocky bald knob, and then you know, it rolls off into tundra, and then down into some some drainages. But I remember thinking, like, how am I gonna get close to one of these with a bow? I mean, I was like, oh, <laughs> good luck. And, and then describe to me where you guys got landed, because I know you were super jacked ahead of time. You did a bunch of research on little packable fish rods. <laughs> How disappointed were you? Everyone tells me they go on these hunts and they're like, dude, you got to bring a fishing pole. You catch so much fish. I'm like, oh, for sure. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I went on Amazon, bought like a telescoping fishing pole. It was super cool. little yeah, fishing pole. Mm-hmm. I, had I, had bu- I had a bunch of lures, yeah. everything. The spot we get into, no fish, no lakes. Just tiny. I mean, the rivers were tight, like no fish were in them. Zero fishing. Yeah, I didn't see any fish. I think a lot of those lures are still in the cardboard pa- plastic package that I bought them in. But yeah, no, no fish whatsoever. Damn it! <laughs> I really wanted to go <laughs> and fish. And I will say, like we were, we were in that regard, you know, a, a bit of an, an anomaly because I have talked to other guys that have gone up there where you know they had a river that was a sizable river close to camp and those guys were catching fish and they were hiking like on off days when they didn't feel like caribou hunting yeah you know to lakes and and catching fish so you guys had none of that nearby had none, none of, of that, that man we we were kind of up on a knob a hill we're on top of a goddamn mountain <laughs> <laughs> well, I we, we there, those outs. like i mean of course you get there right away you're excited like you don't care where you're at you're out in alaska it doesn't matter then once the hunt starts we're like shit we have to walk down hill and then every time we come back to camp we always have to walk up this mountain yeah we had to gain i was was probably 800 800 feet maybe maybe more to down to water on either side of the drainages yeah Mm -hmm. all right so one thing i had so you guys landed you know you have all your gear there you have your tent up like i know there's some laws in alaska you guys fly and landed you've seen some animals like what's when can you actually start hunting once you actually land you can't i don't think you can start hunting right away like what's the logistics there yeah, you, you can't hunt until the next day. And I think legally it's like 3 a.m., you know, the next day. Uh, so, you said, so you have some downtime and a little bit of uh, like you guys are all jacked up to go hunting and you can't do anything. Kind <laughs> yeah. Of thing. yeah, and I mean, they, they do that so that, I mean, most places in Alaska that you're going to hunt, you're flying, right? Mm-hmm. And so you, you do have the advantage, if you will, of, you know, flying a landscape essentially on your, on your way and, and looking at animals out the window. So they do that to, you know, just fair chase so that you're not cruising around looking for animals and landing and, and shooting them. 
so in that regard, it makes sense to me. It's a good, it's a good law. Um, but yeah, we, we landed, I set up the tent, kind of got camp established. And then, you know, I set up my, my chair and I was glassing and the caribou right across from camp, just straight out the gate. I think by the time you guys had landed, I'd already seen some bulls. Yeah. And yeah, you can't, you can't hunt them though. Just it's, teasing. Yeah. Just, just teasing. watching. Luckily they weren't very big. I was slugging beers. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't very big. I mean, there was a group of what we see that night. Eight, maybe? Yeah, we're looking. I said shooters. <laughs> they look, I mean, when you, when you don't know what you're looking at, I mean, the first ones to pop up over there that look pretty good, you're like, oh, man, is that a shooter? Is that yeah, a so, so in regards to that, like, did you guys have an idea of what you were kind of looking for ahead of time? Did you guys, like, look at a bunch of photos? Like, hey, this is what a respectable caribou looks like, or you just, like, don't care, just have fun? Or a combination. I was looking at photos, but I still didn't. I yeah. wasn't. I wasn't like too. I didn't like spend a shit ton of time. Like God, what's a this score of a caribou? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I looked yeah. at like this is what a good caribou looks like. You looking at first, for tops? I, I you looking up, for fronts? You looking? Yeah, for, I looked up like how do you score a caribou? I didn't even know how to like that worked. It's right. actually very complicated. It's one of the harder ones to score. Yeah, I mean, I think a big bull caribou is like four hundred inches, right? Similar to a bull elk. I mean, I knew that. I I put a number on it, but as far as you know, what a bull would have to look like to get that. I mean, obviously shovels, double shovels is, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, big bears. But for me, I was just, I just wanted a bull to look nice, you know, big. It's like whatever excites you, you're going to go after. It's like if I see a, you know, an average size mule deer, but the cool adventure and it's like a cool place to go stock it, I'm going to go stock it. It's like that same thing. Uh, Wasn't uh, Schaefer telling us about, he's like, if they have big C's in there. Yeah, big, 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 long beams. You yeah. look for big, you know, big full C, mm-hmm. uh, if you will, if you can picture the shape of an antler, the way it curls back forward, yep. and then, you know, tops, you know, mass, length, obviously off those tines, you know, the the bez and and the shovels. I mean, the width of the shovel, the points that come out. I mean, it all co- kind of comes into play. But, I mean, I I wasn't I didn't think about score at all. <laughs> I, I honestly I couldn't tell you. I've never I've never even researched since I got home what mine might score. You know, I, I wasn't worried about it at all. I think. I think for, you know, I think if you've done it multiple times and, you know, your ultimate goal was to try to kill the most mature animal you could, I think that stuff would probably become that much more important to you. But for, for us, I think the biggest motivation was just like the adventure in it, mm-hmm. you know, spot and stock caribou hunting. And, you know, I did want a bull with, with nice tops. That yep. was kind of my, my goal. But and then, could, then what time of year was this and how, like, obviously you're going to be in velvet probably in August. Mm-hmm. Like, so you had um, almost the entire time you're there, it's a guarantee you'll probably shoot velvet bulls, right? Yeah. It was like time? August 18th. I think our trip was like the 18th through the 28th is what we had. And I think I got back on the yeah, second, first or second of September. So I think we flew out the 18th and I think I got back September 1st or 2nd. But yeah. that was that was kind of the time frame. But yeah, they're they're mostly in velvet. You know, towards the end there, where I was in, in kind of in camp by myself, watching bulls. I was seeing multiple bulls that were dripping velvet. But, okay. Um, yeah, I, you know, we we should have stripped ours off straight away. I mean, they were okay. other than Josh's. Josh's, I would say, the velvet on Josh's was pretty pretty good. Let's let's dive into that. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you know, if you haven't watched the film, you guys should watch it. They all tagged out on, you know, awesome caribou. But what do you think? Do you guys think you did it right in the sense of your – I we, mean, I know what the debacle was when you got back here. Maybe explain some of that. The thing is, too, everyone told us, just take off the velvet. It doesn't matter. Like, it, it's not going to make the trip back, even if you do try to save it. Like, there were people, like, squirting their velvet with all that. Mm-hmm. The, yeah, the, velvet lock. The, and, yeah, and all that stuff. And everyone tells us prior is like – you can try as much as you want. You're not going to see the velvet. But for some reason, we didn't listen. I think maybe it's because we were stranded out there for so long. We just said, put it in a box and ship it back. Yep. <laughs> so what happened is when we were shipping it back, it got hung up in Anchorage for like three or four days. Mm-hmm. And then then to ship all the way down to Vegas, I got it, arrives to my house on a crate. I have everyone's bull at my house, I open up this crate and it's just maggots. <laughs> <laughs> maggots in the velvet. Pro- probably didn't help. We were shipping it to Las so Vegas. so bad. Yeah. Yeah. September 2nd in Las Vegas or se- middle of September in Vegas. Oh my it's God. still over a hundred for sure. <laughs> and like you look, it's just in a cardboard box. Yeah. It wasn't anything special. Just a regular huge cardboard box with all the antlers. Like, obviously, you split the skull cap so you yep. can fit him in there, just covered in maggots. I mean, Luke's bull was pretty well, you know, coming apart. Like, that bull was, you know, the velvet was definitely, it was it was close. So that one we definitely should have stripped right off, but, it, you know, that's not my call to make. <laughs> um, my bull, 
Chris's bull, Josh's bull, the velvet was actually in pretty good condition. And I think, I don't know, I mean, you kind of know that you should, but you've got this beautiful velvet bull yeah, sitting there. Yeah, it's probably there. so pristine, perfect. Yeah, pristine, looks perfect. I'm just, you know, I'm enjoying taking it all in, you know. And, and we did split the skulls, which is another thing you might add, you know, just for shipping purposes, split the skull plate and, um, you know, kind of laying them over on each other. But, yeah, I would say <laughs> if you're going up there, just peel the velvet off. Just and, take it off. <laughs> and ship it back. Get fake velvet. Either that or just mount them hard horned, you know, if you're going to mount it. I mean, too, you, like, they're sitting around camp, too, for a while. Yeah, you have time. You have the time. Oh, I had yeah. all kinds of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So That's you, all you yeah. do is sit in camp when you're in Alaska. Yeah, so you, maybe walk me through, I don't know if you want to go through the hunt, some of your days, or just kind of talk about the days you guys killed. Like, walk me through some of that. I know, like, the beginning of the hunt was kind of a little interesting. That we started off hot. Yeah. Walk, walk, <laughs> me, walk me through that good day. First day, couldn't hunt, obviously. So I guess like our real first day of hunting that we could actually go out, went a couple hundred yards behind camp, see some bulls, start walking a little bit further. Then we see like four or five like really good bulls way off in the distance. Probably. What are you talking distance wise? Probably four miles. Yeah. And tell me how hard it is to get over there. I I know in the film. Tundra sucks. Brutal. You, you, you'd the rather worst. go up a steepest mountain ever. Yes, and, on solid ground. <laughs> Probably take you about the same amount of time too. Yeah, you'll never really be able to totally like explain it to somebody unless they've done it. I was I was trying to tell my kids the other night they watched the the film, but essentially what you've got are these furry basketballs, right? So they're you know vegetated hippie heads is what they yeah, call, they call them hippie heads, but they're <laughs> they're you know vegetated basketballs. And then in between those basketballs, you have, you know, the, the actual ground. And the ground might be, it might be a foot. It might be two feet lower. And it's spongy, you know, itself. So you've got to kind of make a decision as you're going along. Should I try to step on each of in, each individual, you know, fuzzy basketball and try to skip across that? Or should I go in between, you know, and just kind of high step it across the terrain? And you can't ever get like a good momentum of doing either so you're constantly like stepping on the top of one and slipping off of it and then the next foot's going down in a hole a foot and a half or two feet you're just i think i told neville i said you're what it feels like to me is like you're constantly in motion of falling one way or direction so you're just sounds like a lot of fun oh it's it's a ton of work walking across yeah i just it's like a marsh if you ever walked like in a marsh where it feels like it feels like there's water underneath the surface Falling in holes, breaking through. So, yeah, if you see something at four miles, I mean, I figured, I think I took, I kept track one time, and it's like you're, you're covering like a mile and a half, an hour maybe, something wow. like that. Yeah. So you're not going very fast. But mm-hmm. the other thing you have on your side is you have time on your side because it never mm-hmm. gets dark. Yeah. You have 16, 17 hours of daylight. Nothing but daylight. <laughs> Nothing but daylight. I know you work up a good sweat. By the time you get over there, you're well, melting. Sure. But, yeah, when we got over there, it was... We had four bulls, and like where they were at, we're kind of underneath the ledge. We had to come up on top of a ledge, and they're feeding up there. They're bedded at the time, and we thought, well, this would be a good opportunity to go yeah. see if we can't get a stock on with bows. So then, trail my brother. The plan was we'll send them up there, do a stock. How'd you decide who gets to go first? Josh had spotted them, had oh, spotted okay. the group, and so we kind of gave him first crack, and then. There was a bull in that group that I really liked. Like, he had real big, long, you know, tines on the top. He was a super cool bull. And so I, I really wanted that bull. So I think when we got over there, you know, Josh was like, let's both crawl in there and, you know, we'll both try to try to make it happen. Because there was a different bull that he liked. He had a bull that had like a real white cape, you know, mm-hmm. real white yep. mane. He really liked that bull. So that was kind of how it worked. We ended up crawling, covered – I mean, jo- jo- I should say Josh – Neville's brother Josh is like stealthy. I mean, the guy can crawl faster than I can probably run. Dude, he looked like a little snake in the sand. He a little snake just in the grass. low as fuck to the ground, just crawling through the grass. I never seen anybody crawl like that guy. Like I couldn't keep up with him. I was like trying to keep up, what, trying what's, to keep up. What's his technique? How, is he like putting his bow on his back? Is he just moving it forward with him? I'm like, trying to even remember. I think he had it in his hand, but he yeah. was just kind of like throwing it out ahead of him. I could not, I could not understand how he was moving as fast as he was. Like I was working up a sweat, crawling, trying to keep up with him. But yeah, he covered so much ground. But he, we got up to this little kind of little, you know, little tree, little tuft of vegetation, and 
kind of peaked up and the bulls had just stood up and started to feed. And I think they were, you know, 85, 90 yards. And, uh, you know, I'd asked him, what do you want to do? And he's like, you know, we need to cut the distance. And there wasn't, there's no way that you're going to crawl up on them. And they turned and kind of started to feed like back kind of a half moon to our right. And I thought maybe that they were going to feed by to our right, but they were just never going to, you know, get closer. And then when they cleared this little hump of vegetation that we were hiding behind, it's like the only concealment we had, you know, I think one of them picked us off and they started kind of, you know, trotting off. And then that's when I motioned back to Neville and said, Hey, get the gun. Let's go get the boomstick. Let's yeah. do this. Yes. Yeah, so we had the rifle with us. And I mean, we just wanted to get one down first day. Yep. Our cameraman, Luke had a, had a tag too. So that was nice. You guys, this would be a good opportunity for him. Like, Let's get one down right away. Then we don't have to, you know. And it was a good group of bulls. Yeah. I mean, there were some nice bulls in that group. Yeah, so then he shot one, dropped it. Yeah, and I was sitting next to Josh, and Josh is just like, where's that gun? I need a, where is that gun? Instantly just went from in, being a bow hunter to being a rifle. Yeah, that's why the hard part of bringing a rifle and a bow at the yeah. same hunt. Instantaneously, where's the gun? And I was like, oh, dude, would you... I think I said to him, "Hey, would you would you shoot? You want to shoot one with a gun? You'd shoot one with a gun." He's like, "Yeah, where's the gun? Wish I had that gun." So I, <laughs> I turned around and motioned to these guys, and I was like, "Bring the gun!" So they yeah, came. Neville Luke, came trotting up. And the funny part, like I thought I was recording the whole time because Luke gave me the camera and I was filming, but I accidentally hit record again. So we had we have no footage of this. Is that your like, job being a yeah, camera guy? Right, you think being director? Yeah. yeah. And the funny part was when Luke was running to give Josh a gun, I bet you he fell 20 times. Oh, my God. And it was 50 yards of tundra he had to go across. He was just tumbling. Those hippie tumbling, heads everywhere? Tumbling, yeah. Yeah. He was a little excited. Yeah, then we had two down. First first day. Yeah, both, the of, them, both, of, the, both of the fellas made great shots. I mean, just abs- one shot, one, I mean, just three hammered. A, that, 300 one meg. That gun has shot so many critters over the years. That thing was undefeated on that hunt. Couldn't be stopped. <laughs> 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 yeah, tipped both of them over just quick. And then, yeah, you've got two dead caribou on the first day. What was, what was the yardage? No, it doesn't oh, matter. 200. 200 yeah, close. I close. think I remembered. Uh, Luke's was like 105 or 110, yeah, something really like that. Close. And then Josh, I remember being like 235. Yeah. And was it still easy to set up in that sort of train with a bipod or did you guys shoot off a backpack? So they really they both shut off bipod. Yeah, they're bipod, all still able to work through that? Yeah, prone. Yep, shooting okay. up kind of uphill yeah. at, at an angle. Yep. And they, um, like I said, both of them made great shots. Easy, easy rest, you know. Caribou are curious. Yeah. So, you know, you shoot one, yeah. they, they may not know what's going on completely, and they might not just completely take off from clear country. They hang around. Then we had to pack them out, and that was Yeah, walk one. through that. Yeah, that sucked. That was a bad pack out. I mean, it took, I don't know, Josh and we Josh didn't think, and, I feel like we didn't think we were as far away as we thought, obviously. We're like, oh, I didn't ever think, like, oh, this is going to be – like a really long way back until mm-hmm. we started doing it. I'm like, this is going to take forever. Yeah. I, I felt like it was going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be heavy, but I didn't think it was going to be that long. I thought it was like a two mile hike. Come to find out it's a four mile hike. Well, I was just thinking about time, you know, like I thought about the time that we left the tent from the time we spotted those bulls to then the actual time that we shot those bulls. And I'm thinking like going in reverse with a, mm-hmm. you know, 80 to 110 pound pack. <laughs> this is not going to be fun. Cause I mean, we were hours getting there. Yeah. So it, yeah, it sucked. I mean, it took us a long time. I, Chris and Josh broke um, broke the one bull down, and then you know I broke the other one down, and finally got everything loaded, caped out his bull, and got got everything put in packs. And I, what time was it? Do you think we started off of there to like head off like five, maybe? Yeah. Five or six. By the time we actually started headed down. Yeah. And uh, it was starting to. Sp- it kind of been raining on and off. And yeah, we, we figured we'd drop into the bottom. So we dropped into the bottom, hit the, hit the Creek and we started using it we went up it a ways. And then, you know, we got to a point where, you know, we're looking at our maps and we know where camp is and we think, oh, if we just hit this ridge and cruise up it and we just kept hitting like fall summit fall after summit. fall summit oh, after I fall summit. Never ended. And, yeah. you got, and you guys have to pack full on quarters in Alaska, all the ribs. Yeah. But yeah. So you can't debone the meat. Can't debone. Yeah. Luke had a whole bunch of camera equipment. He had like, you know, you camera geeks, you guys have all these lenses yeah. and stuff. So I think I had two, his two hindquarters and a front. No, I had two fronts, a hindquarter, back straps, tenderloins, and his cape. Oh, wow. <laughs> and my gear, you know, my scope. Yeah. It was over. It had to have been over 100 pounds. It was, it was lousy. 
Size of a caribou. I remember we we're like, how big do you think a caribou is when we got there? Yeah. I would say it's like a, like a spike elk. Really? It's, it's between, uh, you know, an adult bull, a bull elk, like an eight, nine-year-old bull elk, and then like a mule deer. It's like that halfway point. So mm-hmm. I would say it's bigger than a, than a big muley. Yep. About a spike elk, I'd say. Yeah. Wow. Big. Big enough it sucked. Yeah, big enough it sucked. And well, you are. You, you're taking all the meat. Yeah. So you're cutting out rib cages. You're taking quarter whole. Oof. All the loose meat, neck meat. All the bones. That's what I was pissed about. <laughs> yeah. Why yeah. can't I bone this out? <laughs> Don't want you wasting any meat. So that was, and what's the law, though? Once you get back to camp, can you start cutting off that quarter to eat? Nope. You, you, can only, you can only technically eat the back straps or tendon. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't. You're not supposed to bone anything out until you actually get back to, like, you know, civilization. So yep. back to when we got back to the transporters place, so they have an air hanger and some tables and stuff. You're actually start to, to bone things out. But yeah. And when you're in the field, you can't bone anything out. Hmm. No, nope. can't even take a little sliver off there. Well, a we little took, bit of... Yeah. We ate back straps and tender lines, but yeah, yeah, yeah hind quarters, front quarters, ribs stayed intact. Hmm. Yeah. Then, then we had a lot of shitty weather, weather after that. Mm-hmm. Sitting in the, Tent. Sitting in the Sky Dome like we're doing right now. Sitting in the Sky Dome, hanging out. And I thought that was really cool, you guys. Uh, so you obviously must have brought a bunch of P-cord. Is that why you guys had that little dry line inside yeah. the, the tent going? That seemed like that was essential. Right. It never it never dried it, but... Yeah. We, we At least it's it. an <laughs> illusion in your head that you're right. drying stuff out with that little stove in the middle. It was dry. No, we didn't have a stove. We, oh, I mean, yeah, your cook, oh, cook yeah, stove. Yeah, yeah we, we took a, kick, a cook stove, just like a little half gin. Nothing dries in Alaska. Is that why Trail always had his bare feet just hanging oh, out? Yeah. In the tent? Yeah, because my socks were always wet. Yeah, boots are always wet. And you're hanging your socks up. And, you know, I had some extra socks, but... Dude, I brought one pair of pants. <laughs> Dude, I was... Hunt, I was you were I was, backcountry hunting like we're used to. I literally had the same backcountry gear list I have on a Wyoming elk that I do in Alaska. I did bring two pairs of pants. Smart. I had one pair of pants. I'm like, well, I guess I'm just going to be wet. <laughs> <laughs> you could just wear your rain pants the next day, maybe. Yeah, I mean, somebody, somebody told me a long time ago, when you're hunting Alaska, it doesn't really matter if you're wet or dry, because you're always going to be wet. What matters most is that you're warm. So warm and wet is, yeah. is kind of what you're going for. But, I mean, we, we were damp, I would say, the whole time. Oh, yeah, for sure. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, you can't you can't help being a little bit wet. But we, yeah, I mean, having the stove in the tent, just your body heat, it, it would dry out. I would say it didn't ever get completely dry, but it was drier the next day. And then with us sitting in the camp all the time, I did have this, I wrote down a list of stuff that we should have brought. That's always good. I think that's one of the essential things while you're on a hunt, figuring out what gear you maybe brought with or what gear you missed. And one of them was more reading material and more in an iPad with movies. <laughs> iPad with movies. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't have any anything to watch. I did bring one book. Uh, I wish I'd have brought some more books. And then we we had uh, what one download, one Netflix show download. That wasn't even on purpose. That was purely by accident. Purely you guys accident. watched the same show like hundred times. We watched times? it one time. I thought we watched it twice. I think it was just once. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Bo Burnham. Uh, yeah, Bo Burnham. Special yeah. on that. Should have brought that CJ Box book we had bear hunting. I, I got know. you all hooked on. I bought a book in uh, Anchorage at the airport once upon a time in Hollywood. They had there's nothing, a bunch there. of shitty books. I thought. I mean, I, anything I wish, at that point would have been great. Yeah, so I would definitely bring more reading material, stuff to do in camp. Yeah, exactly. While, while you're killing time, because you're definitely going to have a couple of days where. So what you guys, what do you guys do when you're just sitting in this tent with a bunch of dudes? <laughs> Nothing. Like, what are you guys' conversations like? As you guys get d- dive off and like just anything, like you there's think of? not one thing we didn't talk about. <laughs> you name it, you guys we solved talked every about. world problem. We oh talked about God. everything. We talked just, about just trying to pass the time, huh? We talked about how, how bad I need stories. a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> we talked religion. We talked all kinds of stuff. I mean, we we dove into everybody's deepest, darkest. I'd never been more excited to be like, all right. I think we better go down the river and get some water. <laughs> yeah, we did take breaks, run down and filter some water and get camp water. You just eat. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that that was another thing I have on my list. Bring more food. Bring more food. Yeah, Trill no. ate all of his food in like the first <laughs> couple hours of the day. He's like, damn, I should have brought more food. <laughs> yeah. Everybody I've ever talked to, there's kind of a sweet spot. You feel like you're definitely taking more food than you would on a normal backpack elk hunt, for example. So you yep. almost feel a little bit gluttonous, like, look at all this food I have. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, you get multiple days strung together. If you're stuck in the tent, you know, you're bored, you're eating, you're tired. You just, you know, burn 8,000 calories in a day hiking a caribou out. Like you, you want to eat and kind of replenish that. So I would say there's, 
there's definitely like a sweet spot. You don't want to take too much, but you definitely want to take enough. Yeah. So, I mean, we took, you know, we tried to take some sides. We brought some potatoes and some rice, but like more of that kind of stuff would have been great. Yeah. That's what I have on here. More cooking food, like actual, like. Dehydrated vegetables would have been great. Yeah, some more that dehydrated. Some bacon, brick of cheese would have been awesome. Oh, my God. Could you guys bring like canned beans oh, or that yeah. sort of stuff? Mm-hmm. Like oh, yeah. Good? Yeah, we could have done. Definitely could have brought more of that type of like. Ramen. Camp cooking food. Because yeah. what was the one thing you guys cooked off the whole time? That little jet boil? Yeah, the half gen jet boil. Yeah, How'd that a, work? It's a jet boil half gen stove. Worked awesome. Yeah. yeah it comes oh. with a little pan. I mean, we, we cooked back straps and, and then we all had our own just like little stoves. Yep. For yeah. Like for, coffee for, and yeah, whatever. coffee or just water if we did like a peak refuel or mountain yeah, house. Most dinners, that's what we had, just peak refuel. I think some of the best dinners we had, we did like a, you know, tenderloin or backstrap the one night we had heart. So we did heart and, you know, potatoes and that was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, but you know, for breakfast and those kinds of things, like some bacon would have been awesome. Some eggs. Some cheese. I don't know <laughs> if you're getting eggs. eggs in there, but hard boiled eggs maybe. <laughs> What's other things on your list that you, your wish list? Maybe just run through those. I, I'm pretty sure I made this with trail when we were streaming it out there. This was on August 29th at 5 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I have Alaska stuff we should have brought. More cooking food, iPad with movies, more reading material, more clothes, mm. pop out plates and bowls. Yeah. More booze, more mixed drink stuff, <laughs> tobacco, <laughs> judo tips. All gluttonous things. Oh, yeah. Judo oh, yeah. tips would have been really good. Judo tips, because we did have, Trail brought a couple of judo tips. Yeah, but we broke them off pretty quick. You were shooting just stump shooting, you know, yeah. like you know bushes and stuff yeah. like that. But it's pretty rocky underneath, so you're yeah. constantly busting points. And then I had more fuel and then more charging bricks. Oh yeah, because towards the end we were running low on power source, and it kind of mm. rained almost every day. So like a solar panel is not probably going to cut it up. Yeah, right? we, we had a solar panel. We it all just had didn't, solar panels. Just like, oh, didn't this work power. that well. I mean, it worked good enough that we got some, but not well it's enough. It's never but, sunny there. Yeah, it was never sunny. It's always overcast. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, um, what was the one thing that you said? Not judo tips. Um, pop out plates and bowls. Pop out plates and bowls. Yeah, we, that would have been great. We ended up just eating m- mostly out of our own, you know, coffee mugs. Yeah, but yeah, those little we, foldable things yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. those would have been great. Yeah, just just a cutting cutting board would have been pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, we were just oh, because that's we did get a water jug from the transporter. Yeah, we did. They gave us a big like water can- jug. So we're just cutting right on top of that. What about bringing some like soup? That would have been great, or something like that. Oh my god, like some hot and hot and a lot, you know? Yeah, some broth. Some of those ramen bowls would have been phenomenal with some steak. That would have been great, and um, some like cream, cream of mushroom soup would have been we awesome. Straight packed like it was a backcountry hunt. <laughs> yeah, we did have the one night, didn't we? Have didn't we bring some cream of mushroom soup? Yeah, we had I, one can, I think. We did one, one or two cans of that, and we did like a like a beef stroganoff type, you know, with some steaks. And I think that night we ate till we were sick. Like we ate a lot. Yeah, that was really good. We yeah. ate well up until the point where, you know, I we were, I ran out of food more basically. But, <laughs> hmm. mm-hmm. but yeah, we sat in the sat in the tent for some shitty weather for a couple of days. Had one decent day, but then they were seen just caribou far off and trail mentions this in the video like you were saying that the caribou probably know after a while that you've hunted you know a half mile around your camp there's a landing strip like that's where all the hunters hunt yeah all your so, kind of blacklisted that yeah, so the, the caribou start to know that we were seeing caribou around camp i would say but they weren't you were seeing cows and calves and small bulls like there was definitely the bigger bulls that we saw the mature bulls were at this you know, brink, kind of a brink around, around it, which was about four miles, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys should have set up like a scarecrow way out some distance, to like yeah. just trick the caribou. Trick, trick and like, oh, four now. Miles. <laughs> oh, maybe. I was hoping they'd come <laughs> back to you, but maybe that wouldn't work that yeah. well. I mean, I did see the very last day I was there on my own. I saw a couple of really nice bulls just right out of camp. Um, but other than that, I would say every, you know, big mature bull that we would have wanted to hunt or kill was quite a ways from camp so it become like difficult then the thought process like every day you have to go further and further yeah yeah the day after we killed and packed those two out the next day we stayed in camp the day after that we didn't see hardly any caribou and it was probably the best weather day that we had which was a bummer because like i said we didn't see that many bulls uh, at all and then the day after that was the day that he and i both killed yeah and that's when we got smart and we're like all right let's just stick to the river bottom 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the river bottoms is yeah. save on time and effort. Yeah. And yeah, just solid ground. Just peel off. It was so nice just to have solid ground under your feet. Yeah, so just peel off, hit those creek bottoms, and, and they're super rocky. Do you think logistic-wise you guys could have brought, like, a little spike tent set up to maybe, like, go out and try to camp from it? Or? You could have. We th- we talked about it. I yeah. think I noted it. Like, I, if you could you could bring a bivy or, a, you know, like a one-man tent, like a Ninon or something like that, and spike out if you felt like it. Um I don't know how people would feel about bears but out there. I, I would do it. It wouldn't bug me any. I right. think I would go out and not worry too much. But you guys didn't have a fence around here, right? No. 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 We didn't have a fence, and we had the bear meat right by us. We, bear yeah. meat. Bear <laughs> meat. <laughs> it was bear meat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we had bear bait. So we it, had it, the bear bait next ex- to us. Explain that, because I know we got a comment on YouTube, and you answered it really well. Explain your thought process there about like where you guys kept the meat and the tarp over it and that whole yeah. thing. Yeah. I mean, I... I don't want to lose my meat to a bear, right? I worked really hard to get that meat back, and I want to take as much of it as back as I possibly can. So for me, I, I'm i more concerned about losing my meat. And bears up there get hunted. I mean, they're not like bears in Wyoming or Montana that don't don't get hunted where they hear, you know, a gun go off, and they're like, hey, there's a dinner bell, right? I mean, those bears up there, they get hunted. So they know, for the most part, I would say that like they're, they're familiar with hunters and they know that, you know, hunters mean danger. So for me, I was a lot more concerned about losing my meat than, you know, potentially having a bear actually try to get in my tent or whatever. So, I mean, if a bear comes into camp and I've got my meat cache right there, I mean, he's going to go to the meat cache first, right? So he's not going to like come and try to get into my tent. And at least if it's close enough, I have the chance to like haze that bear, you know, get it out and, and try to scare it away and, and I'll deal with it at that point. But that was my thought process. You know, I would rather, I'd rather try to harass that bear and get that bear out of camp and, and keep my meat than, than worry about a bear actually coming into my tent. And it was, it never, it never really bothered me. Like I wasn't ever like scared of bears, but. Yeah, it's because we didn't have one coming to camp. No, but like some people, you know, some people, some people go to Alaska and like, yeah. they're so worried about bears. Like that's all they think about is like grizzly bears, you know? Yeah. I mean, we. And it we, wasn't like, I was like, oh my God. There's going to be a grizzly coming into camp. We saw five bears. We saw two boars and a sow and two cubs. The closest one we had was just right across camp, maybe six, seven hundred yards. And, you know, certainly that bear could smell, I'm sure that bear could smell the meat, you know? Oh, yeah. um, but we didn't, you know, we never had a bear in camp. We talked to people in the hangar when we went back, we flew back in that had issues with bears. And we had one guy tell us that a bear had, was on, was it on the meat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they, they couldn't get that bear off. I think he ended up losing some meat to that bear. Um, that was the other reason. I mean, partly part of the reason we tried to get as much meat out as we could. I mean, obviously Chris's bull, I didn't think at that time in the day that we could get his bull and my bull out. But we, you know, the decision that first day when we killed two bulls, it was like, yeah, let's take everything and just get it out of the field as soon as you, you possibly can. But yeah, I'm, I was just more worried. I'm more worried, I guess, about losing my meat than I am about having a bear actually get into my tent. <laughs> Trey wants to die by a grizzly bear. <laughs> It'd be a cool story. <laughs> oh, that's the dog just yeah knocked that off completely. There we go. I'm back. I'm back. We had what Piper come in here? We had a dog come into the tent. And... <laughs> it was safer than having a bear come into the tent. That's right. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's the other thing. If you got your meat cache just outside within earshot, I mean that bear's gonna go to your meat cache. It's not going to go into your tent, whereas I feel like if your meat is, you know, 300 or 400 yards down the, the ridge, I mean, they'll probably go to that too. But, like, I feel like just happenstance, you may have a bear come in to check out your food in your tent. Plus, you have all that human scent around there, you know? Like, we've been yeah. walking around. It's like when you leave, if you put your meat 300 yards away, it's like you're giving them a present. Like, here you go, have it. Yeah, and I, I'm just not. I mean, I'm concerned about bears. I'm more concerned, to be honest, about grizzly bears in the lower 48 than I am Alaska. I mean, Alaska, at least they get hunted up there. You know, I mean, we we shot a bear that time I was in uh, hunting moose, but um, I don't know. I just I, they're different up there. They they get hunted. You know, right. whereas these bears down here, they don't. Yeah, more they don't care. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, they don't. They don't even equate a hunter with danger. Mm-hmm, you know, right. they think, "Hey, this is just food for me," right? Whereas up there, those bears kind of know. I think to stay yeah. away. I mean, it's not like you're not going to have some trouble. You probably could for sure. But no, I, I like that explanation a lot. I think that clears things up because it's yeah. like it's something you probably don't think about, but once you explain it, it makes total sense to me about why you guys did what you did. Mm-hmm. There was a couple times when I'd like have to take a piss in the middle of the night. <laughs> well, I mean, 
it doesn't really get dark, but yeah. I'd walk out there and I'm like peeing and you remember like, God damn it. All that meat's like 10 yards behind me and you just kind of slowly turn. You're just like waiting to see a giant grizzly on there. Yeah. I think there were three times. There's the, those times when you go out in the middle of the night to take a, you know, take a leak. And then there's the, like the times that I left to go on a stock with my bow. And then the time that you left to go on a stock with your bow, both times we dropped our packs and you know, headed off with our bows. Yeah. Didn't even think twice. You know, I'm not used to like, oh shit, I should probably have some like bear spray or gun with me. Yeah. yeah. And I would say definitely don't do that. Like, you know, that's, that's what happened to me when on my moose hunt is I'd left my pack and we did get in a pinch and I would have been in real, real trouble had, yeah, you know, my buddy not situation. had a gun. So don't walk out with, you know, walk off without your sidearm or your bear spray. No. Yeah. I was carrying bear spray around a little bit, Brady, without your gun, but then they started making fun of me. <laughs> hey man, that's why I gave you the gun. So then I carried the gun around some mm-hmm. too. I'm just glad that gun ventured off to Alaska. It's been that's in right. Montana, Wyoming. It's a cannon. Idaho. Now it's been to Alaska. Yeah, it's a it's a real cannon, that gun. I think it would do the trick if you could hit something with it. Oh, we're shooting it. Shoots good. Oh nice. <laughs> I know, yeah. I like that I, audio clip that uh that it didn't make it in the film, right? No. <laughs> but it was pretty funny. Like, like you hear a little scene, like someone shooting a gun. Then what would you say? Like, Neville, like, oh, Brady's going to be pissed. Yeah. <laughs> one, yeah. Thing, one thing I told Neville, yeah. because like the ammo shortage, everyone knows the ammo shortage yeah. right now. We took, we took some desk, desk pops. Yeah, we're just <laughs> making sure everything was going to be working just in case. Yeah, you know, Neville made the thing. Yeah, Brady's going to be so pissed. You're burning all his ammo. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you shot those, Neville. That's that was right. smart. That was smart. That's right. Did Got blister my ears, though. Yep. Mm-hmm. Walk me through your guys's, your guys' hunt day, your stock and all that good fun stuff. That one, was right, we were just in the river bottom. Yeah, we got up in the morning, immediately hit the river, headed straight down, and then we were in the in the bottom, and I glassed up on this hillside and saw one lone bull. And straight away we were like, oh, that's a big bull. You know, it's a good bull, and the happenstance, I mean, he bedded probably within, what, 15 minutes of oh, us yeah. seeing him? And so he, he bedded it. And it was fairly early too. It was like 10 in the morning. Yeah. Pretty early in the morning and, and bedded. They don't, that's one thing. I mean, caribou don't stay bedded. <laughs> no. Typically very long. I would say if you get a caribou that beds for what, two hours, it's, yeah. you know, he's been there for an eternity. It seems like so. Yeah. I just, he, he bedded kind of on the edge of this little flat that was just up out of the bottom and I had enough cover. It looked like to make a stock up. So Knowing that they don't stay bedded long, like I, I pretty well took off running. Like I, I ran probably, you know, jogged for probably a mile, I would say, and then, you know, made my way up the hill, ditched my pack, and then just kind of started to close the distance. And it was nice because I had this little shelf that I could kind of use for cover and crawled up underneath it and just kind of worked out and started crawling, belly crawling and belly crawling, and just kind of. That's one nice thing about caribou is they've got those big tops. So those big tops kind of hang over, and you can see those above their eye line. So that was great because I actually saw his antler tines and tips, you know, before. Mm-hmm. And so it was great. I could see where he was at. And and I think there's, like, from the video, you know, it kind of looks like we're out in the plain sight. But there's a lot of, you know, yeah, little, a, lot of topography. a lot of, like, gentle rolls that you can't see. That That's, like, what trail when he was going up on. You were just, like, below one, and he was. Mm-hmm. He was kind of up on this little, little knob, but there was enough a roll there that he couldn't really, I was below his eye line, but I could see every other part of him, but you know, below I was below his eyes. So he couldn't see me. And that was as far as I could go though. I mean, anytime I would like try to make any ground on him, you know, he would kind of <laughs> give, give me a look, but I mean, what the video doesn't show, I mean, I think I, I got into position where I thought I could make a shot before he stood up. And I think he was better. I think he stayed better for almost 30 minutes. Yeah. I, I was crouched over like as low as I could possibly get to the ground, you know, and, some yoga pose. What it, I don't know what it is. Downward dog. Downward, downward dog. dog. <laughs> I was in downward dog for like a half hour waiting for that thing to stand up to the point where I was like, oh, man, my legs are cramping. And then he did, yeah, finally stood up and, you know, came to full draw and everything felt good. Shot went off, looked good, felt good, and just dropped in underneath him. Just whiffed. <laughs> just, <laughs> just whiffed. And I don't know. I mean, I don't. I still to this day, I don't know if I had a bad range just because when he was bedded, all I was trying to get a range off of was the tops Stops. of his antlers. Yep. Or if, you know, I was losing feet per second on that arrow because we had been hiking around in, you know, we'd been in rain for days and, you know, my strings get super wet. And I don't know if I dropped enough feet per second that I just dropped it underneath him. I was left to right, perfect, but just right underneath him. And so I thought, you know, well, that sucked up. <laughs> There's my opportunity. I thought, he, I thought he hit it. 
Yeah, I like that part where you're like, oh, smoked it. Drilled Absolutely. It. Of course. Trail comes a full draw. That animal's dead. Yeah, uh, well, he had like this white, he literally had like a white spot right behind his shoulder. And, like right when he shot, like I thought that was like his fletchings and arrow going oh, in yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Nope. Then he just started munching, started eating. Yeah, he just went back to eating. And so I knocked another arrow, crouched back down. And like I said, I mean, they're curious. So he kind of just turned and looped. And he actually cut the distance. <laughs> he came closer to me, like feeding diagonally back towards me. So it worked out. Yeah, and the second shot was great. I mean, it was right where I wanted it. I remember, I don't remember, I probably didn't tell you. I, I, I can't, I didn't text you. I remember thinking, trying to text you on my inReach. But, um... Yeah, I mean, that arrow hit right behind the pen, just just hammered him. So that was, it was good. He ran over and kind of went over into his bottom. I snuck in, and I actually shot another arrow at him at, like, 110 yards because he was still on his feet. I'm like, I got arrows. I might as well. I've got one in him. I might as well put another, yeah. you know. Yep. Uh, but then, yeah, he went over and just, you know, ass over tea kettle, went down. Super cool. What was your first thought when you walked up to that thing by yourself there? Man, just... First time, like, obviously you've seen a caribou earlier, but, yeah. like, your own caribou now. Like, yeah, just humbled, you know, yeah. and and excited. I think at one point I said, like, oh, I can't believe I, I can't believe I got one with my bow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I could, but, like... Because I think it was about that time, you know, after you went on that first stock and we've we've been hunting them for three or four days, like, we started realizing, like, this is going to be a little bit tougher than we thought with a bow. You're going to get chances to stalk them, but actually getting in range and as open as it is, is was more challenging than it's You're, not, it's not like you see these waves of care, at least for us, I didn't have these waves of caribou just coming yeah. by me, you know? And they almost have to be in that perfect spot too. It was like a spot and stalk deer hunt, to be right. honest, is what it was. I mean, you know, bedded and, oh, got to go, you know, and, right. and use the topography just like you would with, with a deer, use the wind, same thing. Yeah. yeah. It was cool. I mean, just, just humbling, you know, and then it was cool too. Cause I got to sit and look across the landscape and just like enjoy and take that all in. We had this beautiful braided river kind of working oh, below yeah. me and I got to sit and watch that, you know, why these guys worked their way up and I'd, you know, go back and get my pack, but it was cool. Cause I had probably 45 minutes to an hour there just to myself to kind of take That's it. That's cool. Your backdrop behind yours was. That was amazing. Absolutely cool. Picture those, perfect. Those photos are so epic of trails. Yeah. That was pretty, pretty it was cool. Sick. It was cool. I was happy to see those guys when they <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm sure. You know, made it up there and we broke that bowl down and took the time to cape it out and everything. But it was I don't know. I love that part of it, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, but it's also there's a lot of satisfaction in it. And and to finally get one with a bow. I was like I don't know, I mean I don't know how to say it other than just like it's something that you dreamed about since you were a little kid and then just to have that come to like full fruition, you're just like, geez, this is incredible. Yeah. And four miles back to camp. <laughs> and it was probably, from where yeah. we shot those other two, it was on the same ridge, probably just, what, 500 yards further down? From where Josh, yeah, yeah, yeah it was probably 500 yards. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was on that same, same, ridge. same area. That was, seemed to be like a, kind of a spot for bulls. They seemed to feel like they had some refuge right there in that mm. little canyon. Little did they know. <laughs> I mean, they did until we hiked out. We just had to work for them, right? Right. So you guys are sitting there hiking out stuff, and you saw another bull. Yeah. Basically we're, what we're, happened, or yeah. you guys weren't really expecting it, right? By no, any means. we're almost back to camp. So we walked the river all the way, probably, probably like three and a half, maybe a little over three miles, and we just have just the uphill stretch where our camp's on top of the top of there and josh looked across it's kind of like in this ravine and he saw one bedded there <laughs> yeah it was like that last break that you take before you have to climb the big hill yep. you know you're like oh let's just take the packs off and fill we had to fill our water up since we figured we were there anyway yeah and josh threw up his binoculars <laughs> like there's a nice bowl <laughs> <laughs> and it was bedded and we said and it was bedded and i was like all right and that was kind of the, the, i think we decided like hey man if you if you see a bedded bowl you got to go for it. Right. Because they just don't bed that often. And when they do, that's not that long. Yeah, because we tried doing a couple of stocks where they're moving and like, all right, we'll cut them off here. But just working across the tundra, they Doesn't move work. a lot faster than you do across tundra. And that's there's the, like no like rhyme or reason in this landscape to like would pinch them down somewhere where you could like cut them off. Yeah. Watching those things go across the tundra is so impressive. Like. To know how labored it is for me to try to walk across that and then to watch them, like even the cow and calves, they just float. Gone. They just, they got these big splayed hooves 
and they just oh my gosh they go they're so graceful as they go across the country it's yeah crazy. so we were once we funded better ones now we're looking at it as our better opportunity to yep smart to get one so this one was bedded and it, it was big enough for me so I said all right here we go <laughs> walked up this mountain another mountain to climb but mine mine was in a pretty good spot because he's kind of bit there's some more ledges on this one and I could come around on the backside and come down on him. And luckily, he never... So it's kind of like a typical mule deer right. stalking away. Yeah. yeah, he was bedded on the side of a cliff. I went up on the backside of that mountain, came up on top, and then went straight down on him. And he never... he never. Well, I guess I didn't know this, but he did get up. Yeah, he got up. Yeah. I, I never saw that. Yeah, got up and then kind of re- rebedded, almost like a mule deer would. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was... And he had two other caribou with him. He let them feed off. Like, he let them go. Two smaller bulls. He just kind of let them feed off because there was times when I was like, oh, this gig's up, you know? He's, yeah, he's, he's going to follow him. Yeah, he's going to follow him, but he never did. He stayed bedded. Yeah, because I did run into one bull on the backside. It might have been one of those. And he spooked and ran over. And I'm like, God, I swear to God, if he goes down there and he spooks <laughs> this other one, I'm going to be so pissed. <laughs> I'm going to have to walk all the way down, put my Angry pack hiking. on, mm-hmm. hike up that mountain again. But, I mean, it was similar to trails worked in on him. And I was just going off the top of his antlers, yeah. got in a good spot. I was like 50 yards and I could just see. And I was able, I was standing up. So like in the video, like it looks like it's like plain sight. Yeah. Like he could see me and I could see it because I was fully standing and all I could see was the top of his antlers. That's also so interesting too. The the footage you get from Digiscope or the guys looking at the stock, you're like, oh yeah, he's so close. Mm-hmm. Like why isn't he shooting right now? Or why is he standing up? Like the caribou could totally yeah. see him. But it's totally different. Yeah, or like in his case, I was like, oh, he's not in range. There's no way. He's got to be 70, 80 yards, you know? And, you know, he was 50. He just he just looked that much closer. Yeah, then he stood up. And I didn't realize I was at that full draw that long. Yeah, you like, were at full draw for a while. Like, he was turned dead away yeah, from you, like yeah. quartering hard, and then he kind of turned did yeah. a full turn back to where he was almost broadside. Yeah, but like when I was looking back at the phones, I'm like, damn, I was at full I didn't remember it being that long. Like, I remember him standing up. He was quartering away, turned, shot. I hit him. The first shot was a little back, but hit him, and then he ran down, and I just moved over, and it was another, like, 40-yard shot. Hit him again. <laughs> my, my favorite part of, like, the whole time is he hits him the second time, and the bull's kind of, like, running down the slope. Oh, yeah. And Neville just, like, takes off running. He's I'm, like, paralyzed. He's, like, paralleling this bull. You're not getting and away. He's running. Like, he looks like he's, like, in the NFL. He's high-stepping, just cruising through the tundra. And we were, oh, Josh and I were giggling so hard. So I was like, oh, look at him go. It's yeah, funny. Then, and I knew, I knew then, like, I could tell because, like, he wasn't even moving. He was hunching bad. Like, I knew yeah. he was hit hard, but then I just shot him again, third shot. And that one hit him, like, right in the heart, and he just, you know. Yeah, it went down. What did you think when we walked up to you? Because I remember this. <laughs> well, I thought the plan was, oh, <laughs> this is what we'll do. They'll they'll empty their packs. They'll leave the meat there. Then they'll bring their empty packs. We'll take this meat, and then we'll at least take it to the bottom. Then we'll yeah. hike one up, come down and get the other one. Which that sounds like a pretty good sounds plan. like a great idea to me. <laughs> they come up no packs. I'm like, what do you guys do? What's <laughs> our plan here? All we got is handguns in hand. <laughs> yeah, handguns <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Know. We sat. We watched him shoot it. Watched it go down. I was just like, let's gut that thing. We'll just gut it tonight. We'll pack one bull out. Yeah, that we've already got them loaded in the packs. But yeah, the, I remember like the look on your face, like. Where's the thank, packs? <laughs> thank you for coming here, but go back and get your packs, boys. And it was, yeah, like it was later. Yeah, it was late. We were pushing dark. Yeah, it's like, late. but it's definitely by the time we got back, which I don't. What time yeah, does it get dark up there? Eleven, eleven thirty. Eight or so. Eight at night. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then we got back down there. It was probably well. I guess in the video, I think I say ten o'clock. Yeah. So wow. after we gutted it, and then we had to go up. Yeah, back up, back uphill to camp every, every day. time. Every time uphill to camp. Yeah, and that sucked. That, that was, was a bad awful. one. I don't know why. Like, I felt that one worse than I did the first day. Like, it was just a lot. A lot of hiking. Yeah, but you, then our trip was done. We we shot four bulls, five days. Four bulls, five days. And, and our you guys, trip was, every time you guys harvested a caribou, it was double up. Yeah. Even mm-hmm. with doubled up on bows, which is crazy. That's yeah. an action-packed day. That was a full day. Then the next day, just blue sky, sunny. We were on cloud nine thinking, oh, we are living now. We got yeah. all, everyone filled our tags. We're going to go clean up my bull, get it back to camp, call our transporter, get picked up, head home. That was not the case. Not the case. Almost. We almost did it, but because I could, 
I had my Garmin out there and I kept checking the weather and like I knew, like I could see we had some shitty weather coming. Yep. And like they came and they could only pick up two. So then like Luke and my brother got out with their meat and I'm like, I was hoping they could come back that afternoon and get us never did. And once that didn't happen, and I was looking at the weather. I told her, I said, We're it looks like out. it's going to rain for days, days. Tighten down that tent. Mm-hmm. And we did. We spent, you and I spent two days, two and a half days. Yeah. So you guys spent two and a half full days by yourself. Mm-hmm. And in the, the shitty tent. part were like, those two days, it wasn't, like, we couldn't do anything. Like, you go outside and it's just rainy, so foggy. You, couldn't see. Yeah, you can't even enjoy the scenery. You can't go for a walk. You couldn't, like, go, like, look at more caribou or. Yeah. Yeah, you couldn't see 200 yards. We had wolf tags. Yeah, I had wolf tags, but didn't see, did see a track. Yeah. Yeah, but never, I mean, you couldn't see. I'll bet you couldn't see 300 yards those two days. It was just socked in, just Just pouring. Absolutely stuck. And that's when you probably put that game plan together of things I should have brought with. Yes, so bored. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, we were bored. And then... uh, And then it's it's a lot of back and forth with your transporter, like, hey, when do you think we can get picked up? And they're like, I don't know. Like, there's... You never really had an answer. Yeah, yeah, because they probably don't know either. No, The weather could be different where they're at. They're trying to look at the weather where you're at. And then they also have other people like have been waiting trying to get out yeah. which is probably like more important to them so like our our like us being prioritized to get out was like at the bottom yeah you guys already succeeded too so right. it's like when you get out it's when you get out mm-hmm. yeah i think the day he did get picked up they kind of showed up they'd said yeah maybe maybe in the afternoon um it was really really windy that day but it was fairly clear yeah and he he, it was like, what, 2.33 in the afternoon on that third day that you and I had been together? Yeah. And he just, we heard a plane and looked up and here he come. <laughs> and he landed and we both walked up and he was like, yeah, you know, we'll get your stuff. And so we were loading Neville and I think Neville came back down the hill and he was like, we can only take one one of you. What was the reason behind that? Too much weight. Because of the wind. Because we had, we had the added weight of two caribou. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, 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 the he's wind. Like, and he's like, I don't know if I can take off. Because, like, it would have been fine if it was a normal day. Like, all, I mean, Josh and Luke and those guys did the same thing. But yeah. he said it was too windy that day that he was worried about taking off. Mm-hmm. And, like, we're on a hill. So, like, taking off is like you're driving off the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so he said, we can take one. I was like, well, what do you want to do? And he's like, I don't know. What do you? I was like, well, let's just we'll Rochambeau for it and yeah. let's, let's see who gets to go. We did rock, paper, scissors. Crushed him. <laughs> <laughs> best, of, best of three. Did I we do best we? of three? I think we just did one. one. Boom, <laughs> killed him. All right, later, loser. <laughs> See you, trail. Yeah. Good Dude, luck. he was. He was out of there just that quick. He was like, I am gone. So, yeah, we loaded him up and away he went. What, what was your thought then, trail? So, Neville's gone. You had a horrible weather window. Took oh. you some days. Like, well, what? every time every time somebody got picked up, it was always this. We'll get you. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're dropping these guys off. We'll come get you after we drop them off. Yep. Yeah, so he told me, I'll be back to get you tonight. He's like, tear the tent down, have the tent, everything, all your gear loaded up on top, ready to go. So I was like, okay. So they peeled out, took off, and that's what I did. I broke the tent down, got it completely loaded, all my gear, had everything up on the, you know, up on the landing strip. And, you know, I waited till. It was probably 10, 10 30. I was like, yeah, there's definitely no way they're coming back. And so I just set the tent back up. And oh, you had to set it back up. Yeah, again. Put, put the tent back up. And then that time I just moved it kind of off the edge of the, the runway there where I thought he could still land. <laughs> but yeah, I just set the tent back up and pulled my sleeping bag and everything back out and climbed back in the tent. So what else can you do? And then you're there. Yeah, then I'm there, and, you know, I'm doing the same thing. I'm looking at weather on my Garmin, checking it, and I'm going, you know, there's no way that he's getting back in here tomorrow and probably not the next day and probably not the next day. And and you guys mentioned you're running out of battery packs at this point. So you have your cell phone and you're in reach. Yeah, I had my cell phone, which I would turn off other than when I had to message. I accidentally took your charger. Yeah, yeah, I didn't I didn't have a charger. Oh, char- like the cord? I took his brick. Yeah, he because oh, because wow. we're down to one brick, yeah. and I was using it at the time, and like I thought we we're both getting out. You know, we're packing up like we're both getting out, and I just threw it in my backpack, and I get back, and I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> Trail doesn't have any juice out there. Yeah, took took the brick. I had the solar panel, so I think the second day I was in there, I had sun, but it was still pretty windy. And it's like you're saying they were getting bad weather where they were at, but for mm-hmm. where I was at, it was pretty clear. 
but they couldn't, you know, get in and out, obviously. Yep. But I was able to charge my phone that day um, to about three quarters with my solar panel. So it was good that I had that. Um, but yeah, I think like the issues for me were, you know, I was low on fuel. So I think, like I said earlier, he, you know, Chris had said earlier, we, we had, did not take enough fuel. <laughs> yeah. So towards that what second day about noon i was like i'm going to use the rest of the fuel i've got and i'm going to cook like a whole backstrap yeah because if i'm here for another four or five days like at least i'll have backstrap to eat so i did i cut up a backstrap and cooked a whole backstrap with the fuel i had left <laughs> fat and happy yeah and then i had as far as food goes i mean i'd i'd taken what kind of like one bag i think of what chris had had left but because yeah, towards the end you were running out of food you were yeah. eating my shit when, when he picked me up i had uh a pro bar I had one pro bar and I had a packet of those energy chews those goo chews yeah and I had backstrap and that was it Whew. so you're rationing yeah yeah that last day like I had kind of just eaten meat you know which was okay I didn't have anywhere to go really I, I nope. took some short hikes out to the ridge and I hiked down a couple different times and got water and, you know I sat there in glass caribou and you didn't sit down and start writing your life story like you're never coming out of there you want to leave a note to someone <laughs> you love like <laughs> keep I, it under a rock <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i never got to that point i never i don't know like i i don't know people I, i've hunted alone alone a lot it's you just know a, yeah very similar so, to that so three days on my own you know where i've got a nice tent and i've got some food it wasn't really like i wasn't down in the mouth that much you know yeah, and everyone knew where you're at like if you're in reach died eventually there's gonna be people coming no matter yeah. what like, i mean i did want to get out don't get me wrong yeah. like i was definitely ready to get out like i was texting him every day being like hey what are the chances i get out today you know and when he was like doesn't look good i was like shit you know i was bummed out because i did i did want to go but yeah i mean i you know i had shelter and i had some food and I had a nice warm sleeping bag and i just I hung out in camp. I worked on the, the cape, you know, I got a lot of the meat off of that. I cleaned up the skull plate really, really good. Got that completely cleaned out and ready to go. Uh, I think I walked to the ridge, the the main ridge that we were camped on. I walked to the end of that one day and sat in glass and, you know, filmed caribou and looked at caribou. And then, then like I said, I walked into the bottom, got some water a couple different times. But a lot of it was just, I think I read the book again. So I think I read that book twice while I was up there. <laughs> Um, just moping around, just you? moping, <laughs> just being bored. <laughs> and that's the other thing is like, I didn't, it's not like I could, you know, in reach people and just like have a conversation all day. Cause I was worried about power and losing power. So, yep. and I, I tried to save that as much as I could, but I, it wasn't too, too crazy. Just, just camping at that point. Yep. Just living life. <laughs> just camping. Just camping. The third day when he came. I will say, like, that day I got up and I was like, there's no chance that he's getting me today because, like, I couldn't see 100 yards. Like, it was socked in. I messaged him and was like, what do you think? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I'm going to get up and go fly in here in a minute and I'll let you know. And I was like, I can't believe he's going flying. Like, you know, well, there's no chance. I remember, though, it was always – because, like, I mean, you're you're 60 miles, 70 miles from where they're taking off and, like mm – -hmm is the weather different over there? Or is it, you know what I mean? Like you never really understood like the weather and if it was different from what they're seeing, like what you're seeing. Yeah. Every day I would get up and I would throw everything. I would have everything packed other than the tent just in case he showed up, you know? And that's what happened that day that he showed up and picked me up was I had everything packed, ready to go. And then I got a message from him and he was like, Hey, I'm going to try to make it out to you. And that was like at two or maybe one or two in the afternoon. And I was like, Oh, okay. Well, I'll be ready. And so here, here he come, you know, and even that day, I don't know if he should have landed or not because it was still so socked in. I could hear the plane. It's pretty cool. I'd never heard of this, but what he did was he just flew circles around the hill there and he just was stirring up all that fog and kind of moving it hmm. to a point to where he could see the hill and he landed and I got everything loaded and we sat there for a minute and he was like, I don't know. He's like, we may end up having to set that tent up again. And I was like, really? <laughs> he's like, I don't know. I don't know. And then he's like looking at it and he's looking at his GPS. And I remember at one point we were sitting there in the cockpit and it kind of started to rain a little bit again. And he's like, do you think we can make it? And I was like, I don't know. I'm yeah, not a, I'm you're not asking, a pilot. <laughs> you're <asking you. laughs> I'm like, I don't know, man. And he's like, how do you feel about like flying in this? And I was like, well, you know, you got your GPS and you can 
see the lay of the land, you know, that we have this big drainage. I said, you know, if you feel like you can fly right down that and just follow the contours, sure, let's do it. So away we went. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it was a little sketchy. Yeah. Yeah. And Nels is back there vibing with the locals. Yeah. What'd you do all while I was gone? I was sitting in Kotzebue at some lady's house. <laughs> Basically it was, it was some lady had this huge house and she would just rent out rooms to hunters that were in town waiting yep. for weather. So I was sitting in this lady's house waiting for trail, messaging trail with, I mean, there was a bunch of other hunters in there too. So like you had things to do. Yeah. I mean, it was still kind of the similar, like there you're the town you're in. There's not a lot to do. I was surprised he stayed, to be honest. I, I half expected, like, to land in Cots and just, like, because I couldn't get a hold of him. For some reason, his inReach and mine weren't talking to each other. Yeah. Um, I could talk to the people at the hangar, but I couldn't talk to him. But I was, like, I was thinking, oh, he'll catch a flight. Like, sure, he'll just catch a flight because, you know, I figured I'd I'd get out and he'd keep in touch. But I just hung he, out in Cots. Wow. Walked around. I did the same thing Trail did, but I was just in some – tiny town in the middle of alaska you didn't find any spot to go fishing <laughs> nothing been itching to go fishing the whole time nothing <laughs> i should have they didn't even have any bars in this town nothing Ooh. yeah he just hung tight but when we, when we landed when i landed we we got the caribou out man we we deboned it just like that i mean we went through that thing so quick deboned it got a flight that day yeah we flew out that day he landed mm-hmm. hmm. and then landed in vegas the next day yep what an adventure yeah, it was a riot. The, the land of opportunity, cool place. Talking Last about it, I want to go again now. I know. And I'm just excited. Everyone yeah. should go hunt in Alaska. If you hunt, everyone should do it at least once in their life. I just want to know why I didn't get invited on this. I you think know. you got invited. Did maybe you get invited? I, maybe I did. Not allowed, Brady. Not allowed. I was a bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> this was archery only. <laughs> yeah. These aren't mule deer. That's why. That's true. You guys don't want to bring a boomstick up no, there. <clears throat> no mule deer up there. Uh, and you guys got to uh, test out the brand new Matthews bows, too, on that. They weren't even released yet. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, we had the prototypes, the, the V3X. Yep. Which, if you do watch the film, we're doing a giveaway on our website with the with the film. We're giving away two brand new V3X bows. And there's details on that landing page that we have the video on. on awesome how to enter. enter. Yeah. <laughs> Which Pretty is simple. a great bow. Yeah. So get in there. Get entered into win, you might win two bows, or I guess you'd win one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or you might win two. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> if you're lucky, <laughs> you have to be really lucky. Yes, but Man. it was good. Do we want to know? Do we want to talk at all about that area being closed off? Oh yeah, we can mention that. Yes, yeah, so because I have got a lot of questions like what transporter used, and I told everyone like sure. did this transporter, but unfortunately that area now is off limits. Yeah, so we hunted an area. There's a couple of areas up there um, that have since been had public access to, you know, public land, um, a, a national wildlife refuge, and then also BLM. Um, essentially, it's closed off to non-subsistence hunters. Mm -hmm. So they made that vote um, just this last year, and then uh, it's through 2023. So they'll vote again. They'll look at it again in 2024 uh, to see if they reopen it. So, um, you know, unfortunately. Neville and I may be some of the last guys to get a chance to go up and, and do that hunt for a few years. And hopefully it'll, it'll open back up. That's wild. Um, a lot of the, you know, the state game and fish are, you know, they were definitely not in support of closing it. Uh, they would like to see access continue as would we, <laughs> uh, you know, that opportunity is so good. And I would, I would hate to see people miss out on that opportunity to go up and hunt. Um, they, you know, they kill maybe, non-residents kill maybe three to 400 bulls a year out of a herd that's right around 200,000. Uh, herd has been declining a little bit. Um, a lot of the science points to the fact that maybe warming, you know, is, has an issue with that. So maybe less water, less, you know, less snow to push those bulls or, or those caribou out to areas that those subsistence hunters can get to them easily. Um, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully that herd, you know, grows. Hopefully subsistence hunters still get an opportunity to fill their tags because, you know, they live on that. And, yeah. you know, I, I respect that. I understand that completely. But I would I would hate to see public access lost to, to that herd, right. to people. So hopefully that gets reversed, in my opinion, in 2024 and people can get back there and go hunting. But 
crazy. Yeah, there's still a lot of other opportunities. A lot of other opportunities. I would say if you're looking to go and, you know, even even look at those transporters out of Kotzebue and just, you know, pick their brains, see what they think. Yeah. You know, there's there's other areas, you know, north end of the brooks can still, you know, be good. You can still find transporters. You just got to do the legwork, do some digging. Hmm. Digging on some insider mm-hmm. information, find some good honey holes. North to Alaska, <laughs> we're going north. <laughs> What was that song? North to Alaska. North to Alaska. North <laughs> to Alaska. Da, 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 da. Where'd you get that from? I found, when I was playing it for that hunt, I looked it up and found it on Spotify. There you go. You guys should have downloaded that and listened to it the whole entire time. You're I did. On. I listened to it a lot. We should have put it on the soundtrack. Right you just could have made your own music video for it. In the credits. We'll cut to it right now. Boom. Cut to it. Boom. It was fun, oh. it was fun though. Hunt of a lifetime. Hunt of a lifetime. Head north. Go to Alaska. I think that's a good wrap-up point. I'm super jealous. Definitely, like you said, after talking about this, hearing it all, it's just all around a, a super cool adventure from logistics to getting up there, the adventure, the unknown, the weather. You know, you guys didn't run into any bears, but you saw some bears, so that's cool. Mm-hmm. Y'all took caribou. Had a blast. Yep. I would say, you know, everybody should plan and do a caribou hunt. And it's pretty affordable, too, especially when you get a bunch of guys going together, split costs, and do it. And like I said, the Alaska Airlines credit card method. And mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Also, let us know how you guys like this episode. We're kind of playing around with the idea after we come out with a going original once a month, following it with a, a podcast episode, breaking down whoever was in the hunt, kind of getting some more in-depth details about, about that hunt and what you think. So we'd love to hear some feedback and comments mm-hmm. if you guys enjoyed this episode or not. But other than that... Unless you hated it. Yeah. Just keep that to yourself. Keep that to yourself. Take off, Neville. He fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Punch that guy right in the face. <laughs> yeah. That was fun, guys. You're going to hang cool. out in the Sky Dome, too. This is the exact uh, smells shelter like, you guys took. Smells like campfire still. It still does. Also, let us know if, how you like our new podcast setup and if this should be our our podcast studio going forward. I kind of dig the vibes in here. We just got to figure out why this black bear that we have on the ground doesn't have any paws. <laughs> we got Nubby the black bear on the ground. <laughs> Nubs. Yeah, Nubs. I think it's a California black bear, so maybe they couldn't <laughs> export out claws in, out of California. It must be. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, appreciate you boys. And if you haven't checked out the film, Nothing But Daylight on YouTube. If you have any questions on these guys on any of the stuff they brought, gear-wise, logistics, again, we covered a lot of it here, but definitely just drop comments on YouTube or even drop comments on the website and the article and trail and we'll definitely get back to you guys. Cool. Yes, sir. Appreciate you boys. Catch you on the flip side. Peace.